Just a few minutes ago, the British royal palace was dealt a severe blow with the unexpected leak of 15 secret letters exchanged between King Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson, which had been sealed for nearly nine decades. We are all aware that King Edward VIII's marriage and abdication were a profound embarrassment for the British royal family, an episode they hoped to avoid repeating. Therefore, this breach is anticipated to inflict significant emotional distress on the royal family and potentially disrupt royal traditions one more time. Stay composed as we delve into the contents of these enigmatic letters. We all know that Wallace Simpson has long been a figure of fascination and controversy. To some, she is the notorious woman who lured King Edward VIII away from his throne, forever altering the course of British history. To others, she represents one half of a legendary romance, a woman and a man who sacrificed everything to be together. However, a newly discovered cache of secret letters and diaries hidden away in an English attic has the potential to transform our understanding of Wallace Simpson and her relationships. The letters and diaries reveal a side of Wallace Simpson that has been largely hidden from public view. Far from the calculating and ambitious social climber often portrayed in historical accounts, these documents show a woman who was deeply conflicted about her relationship with Edward VIII. One particularly poignant letter captures her despair. I wake up in the night sometimes and hear your footsteps coming down the passage of the flat, and there you are with the evening standard under your arm. This intimate glimpse into her thoughts and emotions paints a picture of a woman who felt trapped and overwhelmed by the circumstances she found herself in. The most startling revelation from these documents is that, just before Edward's abdication, Wallace Simpson was desperate to avoid marrying him. In a letter to a confidant named Jim, she writes, I've decided to go away, perhaps forever. I cannot tell it, Jim. This suggests that Wallace was planning to escape from the impending marriage and the enormous pressures that came with it. Her reluctance to marry Edward casts a new light on the narrative of their relationship, suggesting that she may have been more of a reluctant participant than a willing conspirator. Another significant discovery is the illegal collusion behind the divorce that allowed Edward to marry Wallace. One letter reveals the extent of the deception. I am letting Wallace divorce me, of course. Please destroy this. This admission shows that the divorce was orchestrated to pave the way for their marriage, undermining the legal and moral justifications that were publicly presented at the time. Perhaps the most heartbreaking aspect of these revelations is the evidence that Wallace Simpson ended up spending her life with the wrong man. Despite her marriage to Edward, she continued to write secret letters of love to another man two years after their wedding. One particularly heartrending letter reads, What can I say when I'm standing beside the grave of everything that was us? I can only cry as I say farewell and press your hand very tightly and pray to God. These letters indicate that Wallace was still in love with someone else and that her marriage to Edward was not the love story it was often made out to be. The discovery of a long hidden cache of documents, brought to light by Wallace Simpson's latest biographer, Anne Seba, has unveiled an extraordinary treasure. Fifteen intimate letters penned by Wallace herself during one of the most tumultuous periods in British history. These letters, written around the time of Edward VIII's abdication on December 10, 1936, offer a raw and personal glimpse into the emotions and turmoil experienced by Wallace as she navigated the seismic events that would forever alter the course of her life and the British monarchy. On that fateful day, Edward VIII delivered his farewell to the British Empire with the words, A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. The abdication was a momentous event, sending shockwaves throughout Britain and beyond. Yet, hidden in an English attic for decades, Wallace's letters reveal a narrative that contrasts sharply with the public perception of a romantic tale of sacrifice and love. The first of these letters, dated October 25, 1936, 
was written just 46 days before the abdication. The postmark indicates it was sent from Felix Stowe two days before Wallace was due to appear at the Ipswich Assizes for her divorce from Ernest Simpson. This period should have been one of anticipation and excitement, as Wallace stood on the brink of becoming the wife of a king. Instead, her writings reflect a woman gripped by fear and loneliness, desperate to escape the path she found herself on. Wallace's letter from October 25th paints a vivid picture of her state of mind. I really can't concentrate. I really can't concentrate on anything at the moment, my dear. I've had so much trouble and complications with everyone. Also, I'm terrified of the court, etc. I feel small and licked by it all. I can't think what sort of mess I'm leaving. I'm sorry for myself. I'm sorry for the king. I hate stuffy British minds. And last but not least, I don't understand myself, which is the cause of all the misery. Give me courage. 215 Tuesday. Love, Wallace. In these words, Wallace's vulnerability is palpable. She expresses a deep sense of fear and confusion, feeling overwhelmed by the complications and expectations surrounding her. The letter's addressee is particularly surprising. Ernest Simpson, the very man she was divorcing. Despite the legal proceedings and the scandal surrounding their relationship, Wallace turned to Ernest for support, indicating a lingering connection and trust between them. Her letter continues to convey her profound sense of loneliness. I'm so lonely. Goodness me. Her loneliness just shouts out to me, because of course she was terrified. And who does she turn to in all this? She turns to Ernest, the man she's trying to divorce. Of course, she's not meant to be communicating with the man she's meant to hate because of his adultery. Two days later, Wallace faced the ordeal of the divorce hearing at the Ipswich Assizes. Arriving at 2.15 p.m., she was consumed by fear. The divorce, though silent in the British press, was sensational news across American and European newspapers. The British public, those in the know, felt a sense of anticipation as Edward moved closer to marrying an American divorcee. The day after the divorce hearing, Wallace Simpson returned to London, finding refuge in the house that King Edward VIII had rented for her. There, she watched with a mixture of anxiety and detachment as events unfolded at a bewildering pace. On November 3rd, Edward, still seen by his people as the dashing young monarch just ten months into his reign, performed the state opening of Parliament. However, his thoughts were consumed not by affairs of the state, but by his deep and consuming love for Wallace. He was completely besotted, his mind filled only with thoughts of her. How wonderful, beautiful, and indispensable she was to him. Edward harbored a dream that defied the harsh realities of his position. He imagined being crowned with Wallace Simpson by his side as his queen, fully convinced that the British people would come to love her as he did once they got to know her. This dream, however, was nothing short of a nightmare for Edward's prime minister, Stanley Baldwin. To Baldwin, the prospect of Queen Wallace was unthinkable. Wallace was not only an American, but also twice divorced, making her an entirely unacceptable figure in the eyes of the British establishment and public. Baldwin knew that her becoming queen was an impossibility that needed to be thwarted by any means necessary. This fundamental disagreement set the prime minister and the king on a collision course, with abdication looming as the only conceivable resolution. On the last day of November, an event seemed to foreshadow the turmoil in the monarchy. The Crystal Palace, home of the triumphal Great Exhibition of 1851, burned down. This dramatic event coincided with the revelation of a second astonishing letter from Wallace Simpson to Ernest Simpson, her husband from whom she had just sought a divorce. This letter, dated the same day as the fire, shed light on Wallace's desperation to escape from the king's grasp. In the letter, Wallace wrote, Monday, Ernest, dear, I shan't be able to see you after all, for which I'm very sorry, but I've decided to go away sometime this week. I cannot tell a gem. 
I'm going because I know what would happen. So I'm really simply telling him the old search for hats story. I shall stay safely away until after the coronation, or perhaps forever. One cannot tell. This letter revealed Wallace's intense desire to flee the situation that had entrapped her. She knew that the king would not easily let her go, so she concocted a story about going to Paris to buy hats, a ruse she had apparently used before, hoping he would believe it. Wallace's letter continued. Please rest assured that the things in the house will all be returned to you. This part of the message conveyed her intention to sever ties with her current life, even if it meant leaving behind the material possessions that had surrounded her. The house Wallace Simpson referred to in her letters was more than just a residence. It had become a gilded cage, a nightmare prison for her. This house, rented by King Edward VIII, was supposed to be a sanctuary, but instead became a relentless siege. Outside, photographers and members of the U.S. press camped around the clock, turning Wallace's life into a spectacle. The simplest routines that had once been part of her daily life, such as getting her hair and nails done, were now denied her. Trapped within those walls, she was forced to confront the harsh reality of her situation. The following day, before Wallace could execute her plan to escape, the inevitable happened. The British press finally broke the story of her affair with Edward. Up until then, the British newspapers had adhered to a code of silence, respecting the king's private life, but the foreign press had been less restrained. When the scandal finally hit the British public, the reaction was one of shock and horror. The idea of their king intending to marry a twice-divorced American woman was unthinkable. The public and the establishment recoiled in disbelief and dismay. Wallace found herself in the spotlight, a helpless rabbit caught in the headlights of a very unforgiving public eye. Edward, realizing the enormity of the scandal and desperate to protect Wallace, whisked her away to his retreat in Windsor Park. From there, he arranged for her to be driven to France, hoping to shield her from the storm of publicity and scrutiny that had engulfed them both. In a bid to ensure her safety, he assigned one of his most trusted staff members to guard her during the journey. However, in doing so, Wallace lost the little control she had left over her own life. She had wanted to escape on her own terms, but now she was entirely in the hands of the king and his staff, unable to choose her own path. The separation was agonizing for Edward. The night before Wallace's departure, he was visibly distraught tears filling his eyes as he said goodbye. It was a poignant and emotional farewell, one that left him feeling abandoned and isolated. For Edward, this was not just about Wallace leaving temporarily. It was about the profound loneliness and the sense of being surrounded by what he perceived as enemies in a hostile nation. That final dinner together was a somber occasion, and one couldn't help but sympathize with the king. He was losing the woman he loved, even if only for a short time, and the pain was evident. The journey to France was fraught with tension and danger. Edward lent his Buick and chauffeur for the trip, but it quickly became apparent that they were being followed. The chauffeur, skilled and alert, recognized the signs of pursuit. Wallace, meanwhile, cowered in the back seat, a blanket draped over her head in a desperate attempt to avoid recognition. The era did not yet know the term paparazzi, but the relentless pursuit by the press was a precursor to the modern-day phenomenon. The fear and anxiety that accompanied Wallace on that journey were palpable. In December 1936, Wallace Simpson found herself ensconced in the Villa Louvaisienne, perched in the serene hills above Cannes, a place that just days earlier seemed an idyllic escape from the tumult engulfing her life yet the serenity belied the storm raging within her heart and mind. Just days before her arrival at this villa, Wallace had desperately pleaded with Edward, imploring him to reconsider his abdication. She didn't want him to relinquish the throne. She simply wanted to be with him, without the weighty crown of a royal marriage. Edward VIII, however, remained resolute. His desire to marry Wallace was unwavering, 
driven by an almost desperate need to ensure she would be his, to defy any who sought to keep them apart. For Edward, abdicating the throne was the only path to marry Wallace legally, a decision he made against the counsel of his advisors and the disapproval of the British establishment. The thought of losing Wallace was unbearable to him. Meanwhile, Wallace's feelings were far more complex. She had never sought the crown or the title of queen. Her attempts to extricate herself from the whirlwind romance and impending marriage were sincere and heartfelt. In a last-ditch effort to avoid what she saw as a life sentence with Edward, she drafted a poignant note to the British government, publicly renouncing any intention to marry the king. The note reflected her desperation and the depth of her turmoil, but it was futile. The wheels of destiny had been set in motion, and there was no turning back. There was no turning. To the world at large, Wallace appeared to have achieved her goal. She had won the heart of the king. However, privately, she was devastated. The abdication marked the beginning of a nightmare rather than a triumph. She faced a future with Edward, a man she loved but whose world she had not bargained for. More agonizingly, in the midst of the chaos and scrutiny, Wallace began to realize that the man she truly loved was not Edward, but her estranged husband, Ernest Simpson. The magnitude of her predicament weighed heavily on Wallace. How had she, a woman of wit and charm, fallen into such a monumental error of judgment? She had navigated a world of privilege and intrigue, yet now found herself isolated and frightened in a foreign land. The newfound letters and diaries discovered by Anne Seba paint a poignant picture of Wallace's inner turmoil during this tumultuous period. On December 10, 1936, as the world listened to Edward VIII's abdication speech, Wallace Simpson listened too, but her tears were not for him. They were for herself, for the life she had lost and the uncertain future ahead. The abdication meant that for the next four months, Edward and Wallace could not be together publicly, lest it be seen as evidence of collusion in her divorce, a legal and social scandal in the eyes of 1930s society. Edward, now the Duke of Windsor, sought refuge in Austria, but his movements were shadowed by the relentless pursuit of the press. Meanwhile, Wallace remained in France, isolated and fearful. In her letters to Ernest, she sought solace and understanding from the man she was divorcing, acknowledging the simplicity and sweetness of the life they once shared. Her letters reveal a woman grappling with regret and a profound sense of loss. The Peter Pan plan, a term she used to describe Edward's persistent immaturity, underscored her disillusionment with the reality of their situation. Wallace longed for the days when life was uncomplicated, when her biggest worries were far removed from the scrutiny of the press and the expectations of royalty. Wallace Simpson's journey from a challenging upbringing in Baltimore to her pivotal role in British history is a tale of ambition, resilience, and fateful encounters. Wallace Warfield faced early hardships with the loss of her father shortly after birth and grew up in a financially precarious situation with her mother, Alice Montague Warfield, in Baltimore, Maryland. Her mother, struggling to make ends meet, later worked as a paid hostess at a club to support them, illustrating the tough circumstances in which Wallace spent her formative years. At the age of 19, Wallace married her first husband, Wynne Spencer, a U.S. Navy aviator, seeking a way out of her challenging circumstances. However, the marriage did not provide the stability she craved, and the couple soon separated. It was during this period that Wallace's determination to secure her future through marriage became apparent. A reflection of the times when financial security for women often came through marriage to wealthy or well-connected men. Ernest Simpson, whom Wallace met and later married in 1928, emerged as a pivotal figure in her life. Ernest, like Wallace, had experienced the devastation of World War I, having served with distinction for Britain. He embodied the qualities of an English gentleman, kind, dependable, and honorable, 
traits that endeared him not only to Wallace, but also to his extended family, who saw him as a benevolent figure akin to a fairy godfather. The relationship between Wallace and Ernest blossomed amidst their respective divorces from their first spouses. Wallace, in a letter to her mother during this time, expressed her fondness for Ernest and acknowledged the kindness he provided. For Wallace, Ernest represented the security and stability she had long sought, and together they embarked on a life in London, purchasing a flat at number five Bryanston Court. It was here that they began their ascent into British society, driven by Wallace's ambition and keen social acumen. Through a mutual connection, Wallace was introduced to Lady Thelma Furness, a well-connected socialite who was romantically involved with Edward, Prince of Wales, the dashing and charismatic heir to the British throne. Edward, popularly admired as a heroic figure and seen as the epitome of royal elegance, seemed destined for a traditional path of marriage, family, and monarchy succession. His relationship with Lady Furness was well known and viewed positively by the public. Wallace, leveraging her charm and wit, quickly established herself within the social circles that orbited around Edward. She cultivated friendships and connections, positioning herself strategically to ascend society's ladder. Her interactions with Edward, initially innocent and social, soon developed into something deeper, fueled by mutual attraction and shared interests. As Wallace became increasingly intertwined with Edward's life, their relationship grew more significant. She captivated Edward with her intelligence, sophistication, and worldly allure, qualities that contrasted sharply with the expectations of a future queen consort of England. While Edward was drawn to Wallace's independence and modernity, their affair unfolded against the backdrop of an era steeped in tradition and rigid societal norms. In January 1931, Wallace Simpson and her husband, Ernest, were invited to a country house party in Leicestershire, an event that would dramatically alter the course of Wallace's life and, inadvertently, British royal history. Among the guests awaited Edward, Prince of Wales, the world's most eligible bachelor and heir to the British throne. Edward, unlike his father, King George V, who epitomized regal stiffness and formality, was known for his charm, charisma, and somewhat rebellious demeanor. He stood out in stark contrast to the royal decorum of his predecessors, often seen in casual attire like peaked caps and unafraid to break tradition with his relaxed demeanor. Wallace, with her sharp wit, sophistication, and American allure, captivated Edward's attention from the start. The prince was drawn to her vivacious personality and independent spirit, finding in Wallace a refreshing contrast to the expectations and rigidity of British aristocracy. The Simpsons soon became regular guests at Edward's weekend retreat, Fort Belvedere, nestled within Windsor Park. This proximity allowed Wallace to cultivate a close friendship with Edward, sharing moments of laughter, intellectual exchange, and perhaps the beginnings of a deeper connection. In January 1934, Thelma Furness, Edward's then-girlfriend and a close confidant of Wallace, had to travel to America. Furness had grown fond of Wallace, often enjoying lunches together at the Ritz, where they discussed a wide array of topics, including Edward. During one such lunch, in a moment that would change everything, Furness playfully suggested to Wallace to look after the little man, referring affectionately to Edward. This informal request hinted at the growing intimacy between Edward and Wallace, although at the time it may have seemed innocent banter among friends. Wallace, ever astute and aware of the dynamics at play, kept a watchful eye on Edward while maintaining her public friendship with Thelma. She often wrote to her Aunt Bessie about the excitement of hosting the Prince of Wales at Bryanston Court, their London residence. Despite the attraction and chemistry between Edward and Wallace, she humorously noted that Ernest, her husband, was always present like a safety net, ensuring that their interactions remained above reproach. 
The turning point came when Thelma returned from America, and during another lunch together, Edward playfully picked a lettuce leaf off his plate. In a gesture that spoke volumes, Wallace gently slapped his hand, a moment of playful flirtation that resonated deeply with Thelma, who instantly recognized the shift in dynamics. Wallace had subtly but unmistakably become more than just a friend to the Prince of Wales. She had become his confidant, his companion, and perhaps his lover. During that fateful summer, Wallace Simpson found herself immersed in a whirlwind romance with Edward VIII, the Prince of Wales, as they joined a holiday party in the enchanting south of France. Observers noted how Edward seemed utterly captivated by Wallace, trailing after her like a devoted companion. For Edward, who had always felt constrained by the duties of royalty and the expectations of his position, Wallace represented a rare escape, a person with whom he could drop his guard and be himself. At the conclusion of their summer holiday, Edward made a poignant gesture of his affection by presenting Wallace with a velvet Cartier pouch containing a diamond and sapphire charm. This gift was just the beginning of a lavish display of jewels and elegant objects that Edward would shower upon her over the years. These treasures were not merely tokens of his love, but symbolic offerings, acknowledging Wallace's sway over him, almost akin to supernatural powers. However, not everyone views Wallace's relationship with Edward through a romantic lens. Many in society, including some of Wallace's acquaintances and critics, saw her as a gold digger someone who strategically pursued relationships for financial gain and social status. This perception was not unfounded, given the substantial wealth and privileges that came with her association with the Prince of Wales. With Meanwhile, Ernest Simpson, Wallace's estranged husband who remained in their London flat, found humor and perhaps some bemusement in Wallace's royal affair. He joked with friends that she had ventured into Peter Pan's Neverland, a world of eternal youth and fantasy, far removed from the realities of their marriage. Yet Ernest also benefited from the royal connection in unexpected ways. One anecdote illustrates the peculiar dynamics of their situation. Edward had tweed specially woven for himself, from which he had a coat tailored. When Ernest expressed admiration for the fabric, Edward generously offered him the remaining tweed, suggesting that Ernest could have a coat made from it as well. This gesture, while seemingly benign, carried with it a tongue-in-cheek implication among some observers that Ernest had swapped his wife, Wallace, for a coat, a wry commentary on the unconventional nature of their relationship and the benefits that accrued from their association with royalty. Edward's influence opened doors for Ernest in unexpected ways, including an invitation to join his Masonic Lodge. This wasn't merely a symbolic gesture, but a practical one that granted Ernest access to Edward's circle of wealthy and influential friends. Through these connections, Ernest found himself in a world of privilege and opportunity that he might not have accessed otherwise. This inclusion was not just about social status, but also about solidifying their collective presence in elite circles. Wallace and Ernest approached their association with Edward as a team, navigating the intricate rules and expectations of their roles. The game of maintaining a royal mistress had its own set of norms and protocols, and Ernest's participation was integral to its success. According to those familiar with their social circles, Ernest was expected to engage in affairs with other married women and gentlemen, a practice that was part of the accepted social fabric of the time. Wallace herself understood these dynamics well and ensured that Ernest was always by her side at events and gatherings where their presence was required. Despite the public knowledge of their unconventional relationship, appearances had to be meticulously maintained. They often found themselves accommodated in adjoining rooms during country house weekends and other social engagements, a gesture that acknowledged their relationship without overtly flaunting it. This discretion was crucial in maintaining the delicate balance between public perception and private reality. 
Wallace, ever astute to the nuances of their situation, reassured her confidants that despite the complexities, she intended to preserve the friendships and alliances that sustained her. She confided in her Aunt Bessie that she would endeavor to cleverly manage her relationships with both Edward and Ernest, ensuring that their dynamic remained intact amidst the ever-changing currents of Edward's affections. Her belief that a newer, younger model would eventually capture Edward's attention underscored her pragmatic approach to their arrangement. In Wallace's eyes, Ernest served not only as a husband, but also as a safety net, a stable presence amidst the unpredictability of royal favor. Among the newly uncovered documents by Anne Seba, Wallace Simpson's biographer, are revealing letters written by Ernest Simpson to his mother in America. These letters offer a unique perspective into the intricate dynamics of their relationship with the future King of England, Edward VIII, and the evolving sentiments within their unconventional triangle. In April 1935, Ernest writes to his mother with evident excitement and a touch of pride about an extravagant outing organized by Edward. They were invited alongside two other married couples to attend the prestigious Grand National Steeplechase near Liverpool. Edward, demonstrating his penchant for lavish gestures, arranged for a special car on the train and greeted them with a fleet of motor cars upon arrival. The day unfolded in grandeur as they launched in the company of Lord Sefton, the esteemed owner of the race course, from his private stand. For Ernest, it was a moment of shared luxury and camaraderie, punctuated by the thrill of mingling with British high society. Despite the apparent glamour and enjoyment, a shadow began to loom over the triangle formed by Wallace, Edward, and Ernest. Edward's passion for Wallace had intensified to a degree that troubled those around him. He began writing her love letters of an extraordinary nature, characterized by a private, almost childlike language that contrasted sharply with his public persona. If revealed, these letters would have likely caused embarrassment, as they depicted Edward referring to himself and Wallace in the third person as a boy and a girl, with whimsical references to their future unity using the pun on the royal we. Wallace, in her responses, did not match Edward's fervor in writing. While she conveyed affection and responded in kind, her letters lacked the passionate outpourings that characterized Edward's expressions. Her demeanor remained composed, perhaps hinting at a deeper reserve or a more pragmatic view of their relationship compared to Edward's ardent declarations. Edward's infatuation with Wallace Simpson had evolved into an all-consuming obsession, a fixation that defied rational explanation and raised eyebrows among those close to him. Love, in its myriad forms, had ensnared Edward in a way that transcended mere affection or attraction. It became an overpowering force in his life, reshaping his priorities and clouding his judgment. To many observers, including those within his inner circle, Wallace Simpson was an enigma. Described with blunt honesty as having a face like an old boot and an austere demeanor, she was not conventionally beautiful, nor did she possess the demure qualities expected of a future queen consort. Yet, despite these superficial observations, Wallace exuded a charm and wit that captivated Edward in ways no other woman had. Her time in China, where she supposedly acquired a few social tricks, added to her allure, but it was her intelligence and razor-sharp wit that truly set her apart. Edward had been no stranger to romantic entanglements before Wallace. His relationships had been numerous, often fleeting, and lacking the depth and intensity that characterized his obsession with Wallace. What set her apart was her unabashed disregard for Edward's royal status. Unlike English women of her time, Wallace treated Edward with a familiarity that bordered on disrespect, even contempt. She did not defer to his position as the future King of England, nor did she seem swayed by his wealth or influence. Instead, she engaged with him on an equal footing, challenging him intellectually and emotionally. This unconventional dynamic fueled Edward's desire for her even more. 
Her indifference to his royal stature seemed to intensify his need for her approval and affection. The more Wallace pushed boundaries and defied expectations, the more Edward found himself drawn to her. It was as if her disregard for conventional decorum granted her a unique power over him, a power she wielded with a mix of audacity and nonchalance. Wallace understood this dynamic acutely. She recognized that her ability to flout social norms and challenge Edward's authority paradoxically strengthened their bond. By behaving in ways that others might deem unacceptable for a royal mistress, she effectively secured Edward's devotion. Her bossy notes and directives to Edward, whom she affectionately called David in private, underscored her role as the dominant figure in their relationship. She orchestrated their lives together, from managing household affairs to dictating menus and social arrangements all the while maintaining a veneer of control that both fascinated and enthralled Edward. In the summer of 1935, Edward once again invited Wallace to join him on a holiday in the south of France. For him, fulfilling her wishes became a priority. She wielded influence effortlessly, simply by expressing her desires. Edward was willing to accommodate her every whim, seeing her wishes as commands to be fulfilled without question. This dynamic, where Wallace dictated terms and Edward complied eagerly, reinforced their unconventional partnership, and highlighted the depth of Edward's infatuation. Wallace Simpson's life took a dramatic turn with the death of King George V on January 20, 1936, which catapulted Edward, Prince of Wales, into the role of King Edward VIII. The sudden shift in circumstances thrust Wallace into a spotlight she had never anticipated, transforming her from a discreet royal mistress into a figure of intense public and political scrutiny. During the summer holiday of 1935, Wallace experienced her longest separation yet from her husband, Ernest Simpson, who traveled to America on business. While Ernest saw the arrival of royalty as a humorous twist in their lives, Wallace was consumed by her affair with Edward, Prince of Wales. She arranged for her friend Mary Kirk to keep Ernest company in London, unaware that Mary and Ernest would develop a romantic relationship of their own during Ernest's trip to America. This affair remained hidden from Wallace, who continued to see Ernest as a dependable companion amidst her tumultuous involvement with Edward. In correspondence with her Aunt Bessie, Wallace expressed a mix of anticipation and apprehension about Ernest's return from America. She joked about the constant stream of social invitations and pondered the possibility of a younger woman catching Edward's eye. Little did she know, however, that the impending death of King George V would alter the course of her life dramatically. Edward's ascension to the throne as King Edward VIII presented an immediate challenge to his relationship with Wallace. As king, Edward was not only responsible for the monarchy, but also the head of the Church of England which vehemently opposed divorce and remarriage. Despite these obstacles, Edward was determined to marry Wallace Simpson, recognizing that his duty as monarch and his personal desires were now inseparably intertwined. For Wallace, Edward's new role as king initially seemed to threaten their relationship. She anticipated that his duties and the pressures of kingship would diminish his need for her companionship. Instead, she found the opposite to be true. Edward's reliance on her grew stronger. He sought her presence constantly, needing her support and affection to navigate the daunting responsibilities of his new position. In private letters to Aunt Bessie, Wallace revealed the suffocating nature of Edward's need for her. She described being at the beck and call of the new king, providing him with the companionship and reassurance he craved to fulfill his duties effectively. Despite her pivotal role in Edward's life, Wallace remained aware of her precarious position. She acknowledged Ernest's unwavering support and described him as too good for someone like her, hinting at her complex feelings of guilt and responsibility towards her estranged husband. In the spring of 1936, Edward's infatuation with Wallace Simpson reached unprecedented heights, propelling her to the pinnacle of society's attention. As Edward's adoration intensified, so did Wallace's social standing. 
she became the coveted link to the king for ambitious hostesses seeking royal favor. This newfound prominence both exhilarated and burdened Wallace, thrusting her into a role that was both glamorous and precarious. Meanwhile, Ernest Simpson, Wallace's husband, began to feel increasingly sidelined in the wake of Edward's relentless pursuit of Wallace. Ernest, who had initially found amusement in the royal affair, eventually grew weary of his status as a mere bystander in his own marriage. Seeking clarity and perhaps closure, Ernest approached Edward directly, seeking assurance about his intentions with Wallace. Edward's response was definitive and somewhat cryptic. Do you really think I would be crowned without Wallace at my side? This statement, implying Edward's absolute dependence on Wallace, left Ernest with little doubt about the direction their relationship was heading. That same evening, Ernest made a significant decision. He agreed to step aside and allow Wallace to pursue her relationship with Edward. He would initiate divorce proceedings, clearing the path for Wallace to be with the man who had captivated her heart and the nation's attention. However, just as Ernest was resigning himself to this decision, another complication arose in the form of Mary Kirk, Wallace's longtime friend from school days. Mary, who had previously been invited by Wallace to keep Ernest company during her liaisons with Edward, unexpectedly invited herself to stay at Bryanston Court in May 1936. This uninvited visit proved to be the catalyst for a dramatic and tense confrontation. During Mary's stay, tensions boiled over, culminating in a heated altercation in the Simpson flat. Wallace, furious and feeling betrayed, accused Mary of seducing Ernest, an accusation tinged with irony given that Wallace had originally orchestrated Mary's presence to occupy Ernest's attention. Mary, taken aback and unwilling to endure further acrimony, promptly packed her bags and left Bryanston Court, severing ties with Wallace indefinitely. This incident marked a turning point for Wallace. Faced with the realization that her marriage to Ernest had irreparably fractured, and with Edward's unwavering determination to marry her, Wallace made a momentous decision. She resolved to heed Edward's insistence that she divorce Ernest and pursue a future by his side, a decision fraught with uncertainty and risk, yet driven by her belief that this might be her final opportunity to achieve something extraordinary. In her own words, Wallace acknowledged the gravity of her choice. You see, I am 40, and I feel I must follow my own instincts as regards my life, and I'm quite prepared to pay for a mistake. This candid reflection underscored her awareness of the potential consequences and the high stakes involved in her relationship with Edward. She harbored hopes that by becoming Edward's consort, she could transform her life garner unprecedented attention, and perhaps even achieve the seemingly impossible dream of becoming Queen Wallace. Coming Queen In the aftermath of Ernest Simpson's decision to grant Wallace Simpson a divorce, the process unfolded in a manner typical of such high-profile marital dissolutions. As agreed, Ernest would be caught in a compromising position with another woman a scenario engineered to provide the grounds of adultery required for divorce proceedings in British law. This woman, often referred to as Miss Buttercup Kennedy in public accounts, was the chosen participant in this staged event. However, recent discoveries from a cache of documents, including Mary Kirk's secret diary, challenge this conventional narrative. Mary Kirk, Wallace's old school friend who had been unwittingly drawn into the complexities of the Simpson marriage, kept a secret diary that sheds new light on the events leading up to the divorce. According to Mary's diary entries, she was coerced and manipulated by Wallace into playing a pivotal role in the divorce strategy. Mary wrote candidly about feeling like Wallace's scapegoat, detailing how Wallace used her as a convenient excuse and decoy in her marital affairs. The diary reveals a darker side to Wallace's character, a woman on a precarious path, willing to manipulate and exploit those around her to achieve her ambitions. 
Mary Kirk's entries depict a pattern of calculated maneuvers by Wallace, including instances where Wallace would involve Mary in public outings only to withdraw at the last moment, citing Mary's alleged affair with Ernest as the reason. This not only shielded Wallace from social scrutiny, but also perpetuated a narrative that further isolated Mary. Despite Mary's personal reflections in her diary, blaming Wallace for her predicament, Ernest Simpson's own correspondence with his mother tells another side of the story. In one of the newly discovered letters, Ernest candidly attributes the breakdown of their marriage not to Wallace, but to Edward. He describes their previous harmony, stating, We were really so frightfully congenial and never had an unhappy moment together until this mess started. Ernest acknowledges his decision to allow Wallace to divorce him and mentions the upcoming legal proceedings, revealing that Wallace had opted not to seek alimony, a strategic move likely aimed at avoiding further legal entanglements and public scrutiny. The stakes were high for everyone involved, particularly considering the potential legal repercussions of collusion in a divorce case. Ernest's plea to his mother to destroy the letter underscores the sensitivity of their situation. Any evidence suggesting collusion could invalidate the divorce proceedings. The fear of exposure and legal consequences loomed large, prompting a cautious approach to their communications and actions. Wallace Simpson found herself at a critical juncture during her third summer holiday with King Edward VIII, cruising along the scenic Dalmatian coast. The carefree atmosphere of their holiday, however, was abruptly shattered when Wallace stopped over in Paris on the way back. Waiting for her were sensational press cuttings and photographs sent by Aunt Bessie from America, revealing the intimate nature of her relationship with the king. The reality of the impending scandal hit Wallace like a thunderbolt, forcing her to confront the gravity of her situation and the life-altering consequences ahead. In response to this sudden realization, Wallace composed a poignant and articulate letter to Edward, expressing her reasons for needing to return to her husband, Ernest Simpson. Central to her decision was the acknowledgement of her congenial relationship with Ernest, highlighting their compatibility a rare achievement in marriage, she noted. She candidly expressed doubts about her ability to bring happiness to Edward, asserting her belief that their union would only lead to disaster. With a tone of finality, she bid him farewell, signing off with, Goodbye, we all say, Wallace. Edward VIII's reaction to Wallace's decision was nothing short of dramatic and desperate. Threatening to harm himself if she left him, he laid bare his emotional turmoil and utter dependence on her companionship. His declaration of intent to end his life rather than face separation underscored the depth of his emotional attachment and his inability to contemplate life without Wallace by his side. Wallace, despite the intense emotional pressure and Edward's extreme response, recognized the impossibility of reversing her decision. The stark reality of potentially having blood on her hands if Edward carried out his threat was a sobering realization. It became clear to her that there was no turning back from the path she had chosen, a path that would ultimately lead to a historic crisis for the British monarchy. In October, with the divorce proceedings looming, Wallace Simpson made a move to a rented house in Felixstowe marking a significant step toward her separation from Ernest Simpson and her impending future with King Edward VIII. Ernest, meanwhile, relocated to the Guards Club in Mayfair, London, signaling the physical and emotional distance that was growing between them. Despite their fractured relationship and Ernest's own affair with Mary Kirk, his heart still held on to hope for a reconciliation with Wallace. He penned a poignant letter to her from his now empty flat in Branston Court, expressing the deep sorrow and sense of loss he felt as he closed that chapter of their shared life. Ernest's words revealed a profound longing for what they once had, urging Wallace to remember their love and to safeguard the flicker of hope that remained in his heart. His plea for her to cherish their memories and to someday rekindle their relationship underscored the enduring emotional bond he felt despite their impending divorce. From Felixstowe, 
Wallace responded to Ernest's heartfelt letter with a poignant note of her own, tinged with the anxiety and loneliness she felt as she awaited the divorce hearing that would irrevocably alter her life. The looming legal proceedings represented not just the end of her marriage to Ernest, but also the pivotal moment that would set her on a collision course with destiny. Her future entwined with Edward, yet fraught with uncertainty and sacrifice. As the months passed, the countdown to Edward's abdication unfolded, thrusting Wallace into the spotlight as the woman for whom a king would relinquish his crown. Despite the public perception of her as the woman who captured a king's heart, newly discovered letters from this period reveal a surprising truth. Amidst the glamour and turmoil, Wallace found herself yearning not for Edward, but for Ernest, the husband she was in the process of divorcing. In one heartfelt message, she expressed her longing and concern for Ernest, highlighting the emotional complexity of her situation and the lingering ties that bound her to her soon-to-be ex-husband. Meanwhile, Ernest grappled with his own emotions and the reality of their impending divorce. In a letter to Wallace, he acknowledged the irreversible path they had taken, recognizing that her involvement with Edward had propelled them beyond the point of return. Despite his pain, Ernest reassured Wallace of his deep understanding and unwavering support, reflecting on the fairy tale allure that had drawn her away, and questioning what their lives might have been had they chosen a different path. His words conveyed not just sorrow, but a profound empathy for Wallace's plight and the uncertain future that lay ahead for both of them. To Ernest's mother, he confided his doubts about the happiness that awaited Wallace and Edward, contemplating the tangled mess they had made of their lives and the daunting challenges they would face in the years to come. His concern for Wallace's well-being and his reflections on their shattered marriage revealed a man grappling with the aftermath of love lost and the harsh realities of their new, separate lives. In February, as Wallace Simpson awaited the culmination of her divorce proceedings and contemplated her uncertain future with Edward VIII, she penned a poignant letter to Ernest Simpson that revealed the depth of her loneliness and regret. From her quiet retreat, likely in the south of France, where she often sought solace during this tumultuous period, Wallace poured out her heart to the man she was divorcing, but who still held a significant place in her memories and emotions. February the 16th. Ernest, dear Ernest, dear life here is one colossal bore. I don't go places, and I think it is more dignified to be quiet. One hopes to keep the name from the papers, but even doing nothing is no protection from there in ten. In these opening lines, Wallace conveyed a sense of isolation and the relentless intrusion of public attention into her personal life. Despite her attempts to maintain a low profile, she felt the constant scrutiny of the press, a reminder of the scrutiny she faced as the woman at the center of a royal scandal. The boredom she expressed hinted at the ennui and perhaps even a sense of disillusionment that had settled over her life amidst the anticipation of a future with Edward, which was still fraught with uncertainties. I wake up in the night sometimes and think I must be lying on that strange chaise longue and hear your footsteps coming down the passage of the flat, and there you are, evening standard under your arm. Here, Wallace revealed the depths of her longing for Ernest and the poignant memories that haunted her in moments of solitude. The vivid image of Ernest's presence in their former home, the familiar sounds of his footsteps, and the everyday routines they once shared spoke volumes about the nostalgia and emotional attachment she still harbored. The mention of the Evening Standard, a daily newspaper, added a touch of mundane familiarity to the scene, underscoring the ordinary moments that now seemed lost to her. I can't believe such a thing could have happened to two people who got along so well. At least it never should have been like it is now. In these lines, Wallace expressed disbelief and perhaps a hint of regret over how their once harmonious relationship had unraveled into separation and impending divorce. She lamented the contrast between their past happiness 
and the current loneliness and uncertainty she faced, suggesting that their separation had inflicted a profound emotional toll on both of them. Write me sometimes, please, and above all, make your life again with care. You are so good and sweet, my dearest. Wallace's plea for communication and her tender words of affection underscored her enduring regard for Ernest. Despite their impending divorce and her involvement with Edward, she still cared deeply for Ernest's well-being and happiness. Her encouragement for him to rebuild his life with care reflected her desire for him to find fulfillment and peace, even as their paths diverged irreversibly. Love to you, Wallace. The letter concluded with a simple but heartfelt sign-off that encapsulated the enduring bond and affection she held for Ernest, even amidst the complexities and changes that had reshaped their relationship. For Ernest Simpson, however, the sentiments expressed in Wallace's letter did not rekindle hopes of reconciliation. He had come to terms with the irreparable nature of their marriage and the necessity of finalizing the divorce. In a letter to his mother, Ernest candidly acknowledged his readiness for the legal proceedings to conclude, Frankly, I'm in no way anxious to see the divorce upset. I don't see how I could ever live with Wallace again. All the nice things are spoiled, and I don't want to be tied for life to someone I cannot live with. In May 1937, as the decree Nisi for Wallace and Ernest Simpson's divorce was imminent, Wallace moved to a new residence the Chateau de Condé in the Loire Valley, marking a significant shift in her life. This move symbolized her transition from a scandal-ridden affair to a future with Edward VIII, who was finally allowed to join her after much anticipation and societal scrutiny. However, just days after Wallace settled into her new base, a momentous event shook England, the coronation of King George VI on May 12, 1937. From her place of exile, far from the pomp and ceremony of London, Wallace reached out to Ernest, perhaps seeking a connection to the city's atmosphere she once knew intimately. Dear Ernest, how exciting London must be today, if only one was starting with two brushes and a pail. Wallace. Her words hinted at nostalgia for simpler times, contrasting sharply with the grandeur and formality of the royal coronation, unfolding in her homeland. Three weeks later, on June 3, 1937, Edward and Wallace were married in a ceremony that starkly contrasted with the expectations and hopes they had held. None of the royal family attended, a glaring absence that underscored the deep divisions caused by their relationship. Edward, now the Duke of Windsor after his abdication, had expected at least his brothers and close friends, including Lord Mountbatten, to stand by him. Yet one by one they declined, citing the incompatibility of their presence with their official roles. The realization that even his closest allies refused to attend was a profound blow to Edward. The absence of family and the sparse attendance, limited mostly to Wallace's relatives and a few loyal followers, cast a pall over what should have been a celebratory occasion. Constance Spry's elaborate floral arrangements and Cecil Beaton's exquisite photographs lent a veneer of elegance, but they couldn't dispel the emptiness and sense of isolation that pervaded the ceremony. Wallace, radiant in her main Boucher gown and distinctive hat, presented a striking image that would become iconic. Her beauty and fashion sense were undeniable, yet the surroundings and the subdued affair underscored the melancholy and isolation they felt. It was a wedding marked not by jubilation, but by the solemnity of lost expectations and societal disapproval. Societal di In November 1937, Ernest Simpson married Mary Kirk, bringing closure to one chapter of his life while beginning another. For Wallace who continued to feel a deep sense of loss and longing for Ernest, this event marked a poignant reminder of the choices made and the paths taken. Despite her marriage to Edward, the Duke of Windsor, Wallace's heart still held a place for Ernest, evident in a heartfelt letter she wrote over two years after her wedding to Edward. In this letter, Wallace acknowledged the pain and regret that had accompanied her decisions. Anyway, 
I shan't write about it again. It is painful, and it is too late. Wherever you are, you can be sure that never a day goes by without some hours thought of you and for you, and again in my evening prayers at night. With love, Wallace. This message, expressing her enduring affection and reflection on what might have been, seems to conclude her correspondence with Ernest in this deeply emotional vein. It signifies a closure, a final acceptance of the path she had chosen. Ernest and Wallace embarked on separate paths thereafter. Ernest's life with Mary initially held promise, but was marred by tragedy when Mary was diagnosed with cancer and passed away at the age of 45. Despite this early sadness, Ernest found happiness again in his fourth marriage, which endured until his death. Wallace, on the other hand, remained married to Edward until his death in 1972. The marriage to Edward was not without its challenges. Despite projecting an image of happiness to the public, Wallace's life with Edward was marked by complexities and sacrifices. Post-war encounters with her in Paris revealed her to be good company, engaging and charismatic. However, Edward's presence was less engaging. He lacked conversation and seemed perpetually bored, trailing behind her disconsolately as she moved from shop to shop. Edward had sacrificed his throne, his country, and much of his former life for the woman he loved. While his life with Wallace might have seemed constrained and unfulfilling to some observers, he seemed content in his chosen role despite its limitations. The dynamic between them, where Wallace took the lead socially and Edward followed, reflected a complex interplay of personal sacrifice and mutual dependence. Wallace Simpson, despite the allure of a royal title and the trappings of wealth and fame, ultimately found herself living a life quite different from the one she might have imagined in her youth. Her story, intertwined with Edward VIII, later known as the Duke of Windsor after his abdication, is often depicted as a grand romance that shook the foundations of the British monarchy. However, as time passed and Wallace lived on until the age of 89, a different narrative emerged from the shadows of public fascination. The saga of Wallace and Edward is often viewed through the lens of duty, Edward's perceived abandonment of his responsibilities as King of England and Wallace's steadfast commitment to him till the end of his days. Edward's abdication in 1936 to marry Wallace marked a pivotal moment in British history, showcasing his prioritization of personal happiness over royal duty. In contrast, Wallace's decision to stand by Edward through exile and beyond underscored her own sense of duty, albeit to her husband rather than to a nation. Despite the outward appearance of their union, characterized by public events and societal scrutiny, the private dynamics between Wallace and Edward painted a more complex picture. Edward, once the powerful monarch, became increasingly dependent on Wallace's presence and approval. He idolized her to the point where his life revolved around her every move, a stark contrast to Wallace's more measured regard for him. She cared for him dutifully, fulfilling the role of wife and companion, but never mirrored his obsessive devotion. In a revealing contrast, Wallace's true emotional depth and enduring affection appear in her private letters, particularly those addressed to Ernest Simpson. These letters unveil a poignant reality obscured by the glamour of royal life, a deep, abiding love for Ernest, the man with whom she shared a quieter, more fulfilling connection. Ernest, despite their divorce and subsequent lives apart, remained a figure of profound significance to Wallace. Her letters to him express regret, longing, and a sense of loss for what might have been. The newfound letters from Wallace reveal a woman grappling with the consequences of her choices. They portray a soul yearning for a simpler, more genuine love, a love that Ernest offered, rooted in security, happiness, and mutual respect. This portrayal challenges the public perception of Wallace as a social climber or opportunist, and instead portrays her as a woman who, despite her iconic status, sought a deeper, more meaningful bond. Wallace's later years, 
spent in reflection and perhaps regret, suggest a life shaped by the decisions made in pursuit of love and status. Her enduring affection for Ernest underscores a profound realization that the quieter, more stable love she could have had with him held greater value than the tumultuous, often lonely existence with Edward. As Wallace lived out her final decades, it became evident that her life with Edward, while glamorous and occasionally exciting, was also marked by emptiness and boredom. Her candid letters to Ernest reflect a woman who found solace in memories of their time together, even as she navigated the complexities of life with a man who adored her beyond reason, but whom she could never wholly reciprocate in kind. Now, let's talk a little about Edward and Wallace Simpson's impact on the royal family. Many sources record that the royal family was extremely angry at the time of Edward VIII, and here is why. Prince Edward's decision to publish A King's Story in 1951 marked a significant moment in British royal history, stirring controversy and unease within the royal family and beyond. Touted as Edward's personal account of the events leading to his abdication in 1936, the memoir aimed to present his side of the story after years of public speculation and criticism. In the book, Edward sought to justify his actions and provide clarity on what he perceived as misunderstandings and misrepresentations surrounding his reign and decision to marry Wallace Simpson. According to excerpts and summaries from sources like History Extra and Insider, Edward portrayed himself as a victim of circumstance and love, bound by duty to follow his heart despite the constitutional implications. My reign ended in faction and controversy. My side of the story has until now been unheard, Edward wrote, reflecting his belief that history needed his perspective on the tumultuous events that reshaped the monarchy. His portrayal of the abdication crisis as a personal struggle between duty and love resonated with readers, but also drew criticism for its perceived bias and self justification. The release of A King's Story, did not go unnoticed by the royal family, who traditionally refrain from publicly commenting on such matters. However, behind closed doors, there was reportedly considerable dismay and anger. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother in particular, was said to be deeply upset by the timing of the book. Released just months before King George II's death from lung cancer, the memoir was seen as an untimely reminder of past controversies during a sensitive period for the family. Frances Donaldson, known for her insights into royal affairs as Lady Donaldson of Kingsbridge, conveyed the family's sentiments, stating that the memoir had caused unrestrained anger and concern behind the scenes. The decision to publish such personal and contentious details for financial gain was seen as a breach of royal decorum, particularly given Edward's former status as king and subsequent exile. Lady Hardinge, wife of Edward's former private secretary, echoed these sentiments, criticizing Edward's motives for publishing the memoir. She characterized it as a commercial venture that exploited private family matters for profit, rather than a sincere effort to set the historical record straight. There was a serious problem that happened to Edward VIII, and that was finances. Prince Edward's transition from monarch to private citizen after his abdication in 1936 was not just a personal and emotional adjustment, but also a financial one. Accustomed to the lavish lifestyle and privileges of royalty, Edward VIII, now Duke of Windsor, faced concerns about his financial security once he left the throne. According to reports by The Guardian and The Express, Edward negotiated a financial settlement with his younger brother, King George VI, before his move to France. Originally requesting $25,000 per year, Edward was granted an allowance that was later reduced to $21,000 annually, $165 million in today's value, after George learned that Edward had overestimated his financial needs. The allowance, despite being substantial, did not deter Edward from seeking additional income sources during his exile. In 1947, a few years before publishing his memoir, A King's Story, 
Edward wrote a series of articles for Life magazine, as noted by Reader's Digest Canada. These articles provided insights into his life and thoughts post-abdication, and he earned $25,000 for this contribution, more than his annual royal allowance at the time. The success of his articles likely influenced Edward's decision to publish his memoir. A King's Story, released in 1951, became a bestseller, according to The Telegraph. The memoir provided Edward with a platform to present his version of the abdication crisis and his perspective on the events that led to it. Despite controversy and criticism, the book's commercial success was significant. The Telegraph estimated Edward's earnings from the memoir to be around $300,000, equivalent to approximately $1 million in today's value, as estimated by Forbes. Edward's ability to monetize his personal story highlighted the commercial potential of royal memoirs and revealed the public's enduring fascination with the British monarchy. While his decision to profit from his royal status and personal experiences was controversial within royal circles, it underscored his determination to secure his financial future and shape his legacy on his own terms. What do you think about the marriage of King Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson and their secret letters? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this, and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.